Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams, and I'm going to get us started for today's session, A Prescription for Recovery, Hospital Finances Post-COVID-19. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief video. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And now I'd like to turn it over to one of today's presenters, Dan Kosky, who is a manager here at Moss Adams. Dan? Thanks so much, Amy. Well, hey, good morning to some of you and uh, good afternoon to others. We are so proud to present today's webcast, A Prescription for Recovery, Hospital Finances Post-COVID-19. Uh, on behalf of Bob, Francis, and myself and the rest of the Performance Excellence team here at Moss Adams, we're really so glad you decided to join us today. Uh, so my name is Dan Kosky. I serve as one of the project managers and the data analytics leader here within the performance excellence team, which I've been a part of for over a decade. Uh, my focus is, my areas of focus are really hospital operations, finance, and reimbursement. And uh, using advanced analytical techniques and automation, you know, my main aim is really to summarize and present data to decision makers in a way that guides them to their solutions very quickly. Also joining me today are my colleagues Bob Van Gelder and Francis Ralsema. Uh, Bob's a registered nurse with more than 40 years of clinical and financial expertise in healthcare delivery, serving in a variety of roles, but predominantly in the hospital setting. He's trained in both Lean and Lean Six Sigma and uses process improvement methodologies and tools to optimize staffing and enhance quality and patient satisfaction. And last, of course, our uh, colleague Francis Ralsema will be part of our trio. Frances has more than 40 years of experience in healthcare operations and consulting. She, too, is lean certified and has extensive knowledge in process improvement, benchmarking, engagement management, and executive communication, which allows her to guide and mobilize healthcare organizations as they aim for competitive change, growth, and transformation. So there you have it, our introductions. Let's, uh, let's dive in with our, di our discussion today. So as we continue to move to the other side of this pandemic, uh, you know, hospitals that survived its financial toll can begin to evaluate how to recover and improve their financial performance, as well as prepare for their organization's long-term financial stability. But hospitals in different regions will likely continue to experience varying consequences from the pandemic. Your organization can start developing thoughtfully crafted plans to position yourselves for a more stable world now. In a full-scope financial performance initiative, Potential opportunities may lie in three main areas, which are revenue cycle, supply chain, and labor. 
Uh, in today's webcast, we'll outline labor cost management strategy, strategies and explore how focusing on your workforce can help you plan for what's next. So here's a quick roadmap outlining what we'll share over the next 45 minutes. Uh, after each of these four sections, there will be a polling question. Uh, we also welcome any of your questions along the way, so feel free to post your questions in that chat box and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can as time allows. Uh, you know, should we run out of time, we'll be sure to circle back with you afterwards to follow up. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into our first polling question. All right. Uh, let's see. How would you describe your organization's current financial performance? A, worse than before the pandemic. B, barely staying afloat. C, meeting our objectives. D, better than ever. Or E, you don't know, or perhaps it's not applicable. And just a quick reminder, uh, your participation in these CPE, or excuse me, into these polling questions is required for CPE credit. So we'll just give you all a few moments to submit your responses. See, we're actually getting a lot of responses coming through. Fantastic. Give it a few more moments here. You know, these polling questions are a really great way for us to survey your interests and, uh, and challenges you're facing and ensure that we're providing and pushing out content that you value. So uh, really do appreciate all of you that are responding. And uh, of course, we'll get you the CPE credit you so deserve. All right, I'm going to, let's go ahead and review these results. Actually, wait, it looks like we got a couple more folks coming in here. All right, maybe one more moment. All right, here we go. All right. Well, this is fantastic. Looks like the uh, runaway winner here is we're meeting our objectives. That's phenomenal. You know, these thoughtfully crafted plans that you put in place to uh, achieve your goals is really the right tactic here. Um, it's great to see that many of you are achieving those. And for those others that are maybe worse before the pandemic or barely staying afloat, um, our hope is that this content today will help you design some strategies and give you some insights to move forward. Um, okay, well next what I'd like to do is hand the mic over to my colleague Bob who will share some insights related to preparing your organization for a financial improvement initiative. Bob, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dan, and hello, everybody. Now, I suspect that everyone who signed up for this webinar is part of an organization experiencing financial challenges. Uh, some more than others, some are doing okay, but m many due to the negative impacts of COVID-19. So for you, the need is there. But when is the right time to address the half or more of your operating expenses related to labor? Healthcare workers coming out of the pandemic may suffer from low morale, burnout, fatigue, or PTSD. Many have spent the last year or more living and working uh, in fear for themselves, their families, and of course, the very sick patients they've cared for. There may be anger due to frustrations with staffing, PPE supplies, and a feeling their voices have not been heard. The last thing we want to do is to cause morale to implode due to perceived ingratitude by reigning in labor costs, which have often ballooned during the national crisis. These are all valid concerns. In order to move forward, there needs to be a real sense of urgency or burning platform, which everybody can rally around. This should be based on your business imperative. How are you performing against plans? What negative industry trends will likely create strong headwinds to your recovery? Share the message that the status quo is not sustainable. We have no choice but to make plans for improvement. What happens if we fail to act? We all know what can happen as a result of sustained losses, but does our staff know? Does your hospital have a history of calling out doom and gloom every year but somehow make budget as your fiscal year comes to a close? If so, it's very possible your staff won't believe you. Having spent years in the trenches, I know one of the most common rumors during doom and gloom talk is that executives want to improve performance to increase their bonuses. And those kind of perceptions will not create an environment where people will embrace change. In fact, this will likely increase resistance to needed change. 
However, if you can establish trust and help people accurately understand the situation, you can accomplish far more than you might believe is possible. Transparency is key. Years ago, I worked a turnaround project in the Midwest, and each morning when I left my hotel to drive to the client hospital, I'd pass a large shuttered hospital. It turned out that many of the client directors and managers had worked at that shuttered facility. So when they got word that their new hospital was struggling, they took it seriously. Most everybody I encountered told me they would do whatever it took to keep their hospital afloat. Due to that level of buy-in and commitment by key people, project moved forward successfully without major resistance. Now, there are a couple common misconceptions, which if you buy into them, they may keep you from getting started. First, substantial layoffs are always required. Actually, that's not always true. We typically find waste in the areas of premium pay, extra shift bonuses, registry, travel utilization, staffing versus demand. This is especially true for clinical staff who are costly to recruit and train. Nurses almost never get laid off, although some may need to move around within an organization to areas with greater need. Now, a second common misconception is that quality and satisfaction can't be maintained if we reduce labor costs. However, by focusing on removing waste, an environment can be maintained which allows for quality patient care and high satisfaction. So how can we navigate this minefield and move forward? The key will be a collaborative approach involving representatives of all key stakeholder groups. We believe this is almost always the best approach, but it's especially critical post-COVID due to the fragility of many hospital staffs. Involve key stakeholders early. The number one way to earn buy-in is through involvement. We need to share the burning platform and the vision for improvement. We need to listen to the concerns and validate any hesitancy. But most importantly, we need to consider their suggestions for improvement. The people closest to the work typically have a good sense of what is going on and where waste exists. To take advantage of these insights, you may need to rely on both formal and informal leaders in your organization. Now, I've talked generically about staff, but we need to consider different groups with different needs and perspectives. Physicians are unique in that they're hopefully partners with us in our efforts to meet the needs of our communities. They're also customers and often competitors. Physician representatives should be brought in early and play an integral role in any improvement initiative oversight group. And we need to create win-win scenarios so our doctors do not perceive all changes as takeaways negatively impacting their ability to practice medicine within our hospital. Nurses and other frontline caregivers must also be respectfully involved. In some ways, physicians and nurses will be pace setters helping us determine what we can do, how much we can do, and how fast we can do it without blowing up the organization. Now, as we formulate our improvement plans based on our business imperative, rigorous analytics, and carefully considered stakeholder input, we also need to be keenly aware of our organization's history and culture, as well as the degree of negative COVID-19 impact we have experienced. Now, have we had other improvement initiatives in the last 10 to 15 years? If so, were they successful? If not, why not? Is there any lingering fallout from previous uh, organization-wide improvement efforts? Pre-COVID, did we have issues uh, with an entitlement culture? I have found this to be a problem in hospitals with very long-tenured staff and or similar smaller hospitals and in more rural communities. And of course, COVID-19 has impacted different regions to different degrees, as well as different times. Now, as we consider all these potential impacts, which may create barriers to our success, we need to craft our communication plan to take these factors into account. My colleague, Francis Rosman, will speak more about the critical subject of communication in a few minutes.
After determining our business imperative and having created messaging around it, as well as agreed on a collaborative approach involving all key stakeholder groups, how do we take the next step, committing to action? It's very important we don't wait too long. Every day we don't act is a missed opportunity. Every day we don't act, the hole gets deeper. And every day the solutions become more painful. We need to move with deliberate speed. If all we do is deliberate, we get nowhere. Analysis paralysis. If we only move with speed, mistakes may happen. We need to appropriately balance deliberation and speed to make needed improvements. And a few years ago, I worked a project for a health system which was on a fiscal calendar year. And they knew mid-year they were significantly off budget. Unfortunately, they didn't reach out for help until September. And by the time an improvement initiative could be created and ramped up, most of the year was over and the losses could not be recouped. The message here is to be proactive, not reactive. And avoid the quick fix of across the board cuts and other knee jerk responses. Making every department cut 5% punishes high performing departments. They may have significant negative impacts on the ability to provide service. Those kind of cuts are frequently not sustainable and the costs will creep back in. What we really should be doing is focusing on areas of waste and inefficiencies. We should be basing our decisions on robust analytics, including benchmarking, trended data, and modeling of staffing versus demand. In addition, mapping and then optimizing key processes to identify waste can lead to improvement, not only in cost, but in quality and satisfaction. Now, I've talked about the organizational readiness for improvement. When is the right time to move forward? I've also talked about the approach we have refined through many years supporting financial improvement initiatives. And that is an approach which even more critical to the negative impacts of COVID-19 on hospitals and their staffs. The next step is to commit to action. I've recently discussed what that might look like from a leadership perspective. Now, my colleague Francis Rosema is going to expand on the critical success factors to pay attention to. But first, time for polling question number two. Now, remember, you have to answer three polling questions during CPE for the uh, webinar. The question is, what is your organization's experience with financial improvement initiatives? A, novice. We've not been down this road before, and we don't know where to start. B, beginner. We've tried this before with little success. D, advanced, we've done this before with successful outcomes. D, expert, we focus on continuous performance improvement. It's in our DNA. And E, don't know or not applicable. So go ahead and uh, put your answers in and we'll see what everybody comes up with in just a few moments. Just a few more moments. We've got lots of answers coming in. I'm anxious to see this myself. Okay, let's go ahead and see what the group thinks. So very interesting, 43% uh, are advanced. They've done this before with successful outcomes. Very good, that's great to see. We've got a fair amount, 28% uh, that haven't done this before or are beginners and haven't had a lot of success. So I hope today uh, some of the things we're sharing with you will be helpful to get you started because this is very important. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my uh, colleague, Francis. Francis, go ahead. Thanks, Bob. I think you did a great job laying the groundwork on the importance of organizational readiness prior to launching a performance improvement initiatives. So next, I'll walk you through each of the six critical success factors which consistently contribute to, and in many cases, we find predict success or failure. The last year or two has been challenging, to say the least, and probably transformative for everyone, but especially for healthcare providers. 
Now healthcare leaders in many organizations find themselves already facing the next challenge to their organization's survival, namely the need to frame the path back to profitability by defining and then guiding their colleagues through a series of timely corrective actions as operations ramp back up. Whether your organization is preparing to launch a major turnaround effort or a relatively modest but targeted adjustment to your bottom line, good intentions and clarity around your financial goals are the right place to start, but will only take you so far. In our work with hospitals, we found that there are six critical success factors that make the difference between fully achieving your goals in a timely manner or alternatively encountering delays causing long-term damage to some of your most valuable stakeholder relationships and or significantly reducing the benefits you are able to achieve. I'll walk you through these six traits now, starting with the central role played by leadership. Strong leadership is the lifeblood of organizational change and understandably appears at the center of this graphic. Because for any large complex organization facing the need to change course, strong effective leadership is central to your chances of being successful. Leadership must ensure that your organization is properly positioned for success before you start, i.e. organizational readiness, and then continue to provide timely interventions throughout the life cycle of the project with clear communications, success stories and encouragement, or perhaps timely course corrections and barrier removal. As Bob mentioned earlier, leadership must convey a clear and compelling sense of urgency with explicit, achievable goals tied to the business imperative. By demonstrating that the status quo is not sustainable and the negative impacts of doing nothing, leadership must not only articulate the benefits, but help folks realize that change is unavoidable and therefore preferable to inaction. I'm clicking and it's not moving forward. Can someone advance the slide for me, please? Oof. Let's go back one. Okay, we're back. A sense a sense of ownership means that key stakeholders feel fully and personally engaged and committed to meeting or exceeding their and the organization's business imperative. They are aware that success is everyone's responsibility and therefore understand that the best place to start is by proactively taking the initiative in their respective areas, as well as being willing to explore opportunities that have impacts across multiple organizational domains. Accountability begins with leadership, providing achievable goals, then holding people accountable for results, both rewarding successes as well as consequences for failures, and then sharing organizational success stories along the way, while discouraging parochial squabbles and finger pointing. Next, I'm going to dwell a bit more on the importance of the remaining two success factors, project structure and communications. You can't expect a major change initiative to be successful without identifying in advance specific resources and structures to support decision making, analytics, progress reports, and good project management. Anticipate the need for additional but temporary resources to keep the project moving forward. Let me walk you quickly through some of these structures. First, you need to identify, identify the members of the steering committee, which serves as the core decision making body. Second, you'll need to designate a project management office, or PMO, which are resources to deal with the day-to-day -day job of keeping the project moving forward. This might entail things like removing obstacles or working with managers to identify, quantify, and vet opportunities along with their impacts to other parts of the organization. Next, you'll need to build in robust analytics and status reporting. Anticipate the need to recruit additional communication champions and subject matter experts to help you build a comprehensive communications plan and execute on that plan. And then finally, you should expect to engage subject matter experts from human resources to plan for and assist with the smooth implementation of any staffing change decisions your steering committee approves. By creating these structures, you will accelerate your forward progress 
provide analytic support and guidance to your key managers and directors, and this will allow them to focus their energies, and it reinforces leadership's commitment to achieving the organization's business imperative. Last but not least, I want to mention communications as arguably the most important factor to leadership effectiveness and organizational success, navigating the minefield between you and your goals. Launching a labor cost initiative on the heels of an 18-month pandemic means you will need to up your game when it comes to communications planning, resourcing, and execution. This, these higher stakes combined with the greater level of complexity means that your usual approach may delay forward progress or even doom your efforts up front. Although I understand why many leaders are inclined to rely on their past communications experience, current bandwidth, and innate talents, this approach to resourcing the communication effort will typically prove insufficient to meet the needs of a major change initiative. So what could go wrong if you underinvest in communications? Well, actually a lot, and we see this happen all too often. Communication missteps can derail leadership's best intentions and brew unrest or outright mistrust. Since trust is much harder to regain once lost, it demonstrates that communications is not the place to skimp on advanced planning and dedicated resources. By giving adequate leadership attention and preparation to these six critical success factors, your organization will be well positioned for the next stage of the effort and ultimately set up for success in meeting your financial imperative. Now we're going to pull up another polling question, and then I'll hand off to my colleague, Dan Kosky, who will give you a better sense of the next part of the performance improvement process, namely the pivotal role played by robust analytics. But first, our polling question. Is your organization planning on implementing a performance improvement initiative? A, yes, we're exploring options now. B, yes, but launching in the next six to 12 months. C, we have no current plans. D, not sure. Or E, not applicable to my organization. Go ahead and submit your answers now. We're almost there. I'm going to go ahead and show the answers. Well, that's um, yes, 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 wins. <laughs> yes, exploring now and then within the next six to 12 months. I think that's, um, that's timely given the opening up of some of the restrictions. Um, and uh, a good sign that all of you are being proactive, and we're hoping that uh, much of what we're sharing with you today can be used in helping you launch those plans. Take it away, Dan. Great. Thanks, Francis, and uh, also Bob. Um, so collaboration and robust analytics, you know, they really form the bedrock of our approach to identifying overall performance improvement opportunities for any given hospital. I'd like to talk to you all about how we evaluate savings uh, potential at a high level and then look at how we translate that to specific performance opportunities at the department level. We'll then review how benchmarking guides us for realistic target setting for all areas of the organization. And then we'll discuss why monitoring results, results are is really so critical to holding those gains. So really the, the goal of a high level assessment is to give leadership navigational insights regarding their current performance as compared to similar hospitals. It could also give you a sense of your own organization's improvement opportunity. Uh, even though this provides only a rough estimate of potential savings, assessments can help you determine which aspects of your operations represent the best prospects for meeting your business imperative. Our examples today will be focusing on labor since it's typically more than 50% say of a hospital's cost structure, but really an effective performance improvement initiative should also review supply chain and revenue cycle issues. Uh, target setting can be a difficult and sometimes controversial process. It really needs to be guided by the business imperative, benchmarking and rigorous analytics. And after carefully considering the available information, lines of accountability that are tied to the results need to be formally established. 
The allocated targets are typically based on the roll-up of each executive area of responsibility, and each executive must then hold their directors and managers accountable for their department-specific goals. So in this example, hospital leadership established an overall financial imperative of $8 million and then decided that $4 million should be assigned to labor with the remainder assigned to revenue cycle and supply chain. So the graphic really illustrates how that $4 million labor target cascades down from the executive level to the department level. And once uh, the targets are assigned, each director and manager should be empowered to identify solutions to achieve their targets. We actually recommend a three-step process that carefully examines each of the key labor, uh, levers of labor cost management, which are shown here on the right. You'll, you'll notice we include sitters as a separate category. Uh, sitters can be a significant controllable cost for nursing departments and is a frequent opportunity we see. The, uh, the first step we recommend is to explore your director's or manager's own ideas. Your managers know the intricacies and the nuances of their department better than anyone. And it's important to allow them to rise to the occasion and flesh out their ideas first. There are some that may require validation or help in quantifying their ideas, and we certainly encourage you to support them in their efforts. Uh, the second step is to research and consider industry best practices. I think it's safe to say you're not the first hospital to face these financial challenges. And if a different way of providing care or staffing your department works elsewhere, you should ask yourself the question, might it work here? Uh, the third step is to create department-specific staffing models. Hopefully you have the requisite skills with your IT or your decision support department, and if not, it will probably be worthwhile to seek outside support. Our team uh, employs three different types of staffing to demand modeling, which is all based on your historical volume patterns. The first type is a classic staffing to demand model. This shows 24-7 overlays of both staffing and patient volumes by time of day and day of week. This approach can provide great insights for EDs, uh, labor and delivery rooms, PACUs, imaging modalities, etc. I'll, I'll show an example of this here shortly. The second type is a capacity utilization model. This model allows you to fine-tune scheduling of staff procedure rooms to achieve a utilization target of 75 to 80 percent. And these models can be effective for ORs, cath labs, and endoscopy rooms. Now, the third type is a predictive grid modeling, which can assist inpatient nursing units to create daily staffing grids to achieve their desired productivity outcomes. Uh, all these models really make it much easier to understand how staffing aligns or even misaligns with patient volumes throughout the course of the day and the days of the week. We find that this data-driven approach is much more effective than designing improvement plans based on anecdotes or perceptions, memory, or even trial and error. So earlier I shared a labor productivity benchmarking example at the facility level. This here is an example of benchmarking at the department level. The line you see on the chart shows the spectrum of performance from better to worse. The better performers are off to the left and the poorer performers are off to the right. Quartile thresholds have been calculated to serve as guideposts for the sake of comparison and target setting. And second quartile, which you'll see there in the middle of the chart, is the median performance of a peer group. So in this example, the hospital's ED is performing in the third quartile region compared to other EDs with similar volumes. These results indicate directionally that there, uh, there is room for improvement. And so from here, the ED director would then be tasked with creating a plan to achieve their financial target. And after exploring their own ideas and considering industry best practices, modeling of daily staffing and volume will likely provide the answers to adjust the meaning challenge. Here's an example of an ED department staffing to demand model as promised. Uh, the dark blue shaded region you see here shows the average number of patients in the department at any time of the day. So this is like a classic whale tail demand profile that is common for most EDs. The green line you see at the bottom of the chart represents the number of ED holds awaiting hospital beds. ED holds are often one of the biggest obstacles to good ED productivity and contribute to excess costs. The gray line uh, shows the number of RNs working at different times throughout the day. So what we're looking for here is when variations in ratios between RNs and patients are suboptimal. You may wish to increase staffing during peak times and realize savings during times when staffing appears excessive. We recommend reviewing each day of the week individually for insights. 
When creating an ED model, it's important to utilize patient start times and stop times to calculate the average number of patients in the system rather than just focusing on patient arrival times. And of course, uh, bar none, above all, as you consider your staffing adjustments, always keep in mind the need to maintain an environment that allows for quality patient care and high satisfaction. So after going through a rigorous process of identifying solutions, you're now faced with this next phase of your effort, which is to implement your ideas and ensure your organization reaps the benefits. It's important that all leaders have and understand the necessary tools and processes to manage their respective areas of responsibility and know that they'll be held accountable for holding the gains. You know, really, at the end of the formal initiative is not the time to let up. Continued oversight at all levels is key to ensuring long-term benefits are realized. So in this section, we've seen how data analytics can be leveraged to guide many of the important decisions you will encounter throughout the course of your initiative. Uh, benchmarking both at the facility level and the department level can give you a better sense of your savings potential and also be used as a guide to help with the target set of process. Uh, once those targets are assigned, allowing your department leaders to explore their ideas first not only invites them into this process, but it also empowers them to be creative and find hidden gems in places only they would know to look. Uh, keeping an open mind to adopt industry best practices and leveraging staffing to demand modeling can help take the guesswork out of recalibrating your staffing plans. After all that is said and done, monitoring the results and holding individuals accountable is crucial to sustaining the gains your organization has worked so hard to achieve. Um, so I guess that rounds out this section of today's presentation. Next, we'd like to share with you some of the common pitfalls that are likely to undermine your efforts. But first, let's take our final polling question. Okay, what is the biggest obstacle your organization faces in implementing a performance improvement initiative now? A, burnout and morale issues sensitive to staffing changes. Um, leadership concerns about pushback from physicians and or community. C, absence of consensus and shared vision, a vision to implement change. D, lack of accountability. Uh, e, other or not applicable. We'll give you just a moment here to submit your responses. Again, this will be our last polling question, so if you are looking for that CPE credit, please do submit your response. We'll just grab a few more moments here to let folks submit their responses. All right, I, uh, I want to bend the rules here a little bit and just give those folks a little bit more time to get the CPE credit they came for. Appreciate your patience. Okay, um, I think we are all completed here. Let's uh, review these results. All right, wow, the biggest obstacles your organization faces, burnout morale issues, sensitive to staffing changes. I, I think that's that's obviously consistent with the times. Um, and it's certainly what we see in, and, or hear anecdotally from our clients. Um, yes, you know, so, so this pathway to, to addressing these concerns with this, this structure and this framework could really help to invite them into this process and consider their, their issues, consider their place in this, in this production. Um, so great, thank you so much for your responses. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, bring Francis and Bob back into this, and we'll uh, discuss some common pitfalls for you. Francis, I think, uh, why don't you take this first one here? I'm sorry, I was on mute. Um, no Dan, you spoke convincingly about um, the value of robust analytics, um, and project management frequently isn't thought of as being a sexy discipline, uh, but I wanted to comment on the importance of committing resources to project management. Simply put, when it comes to project management, the resources you dedicate to this initiative will drive your results and determine your outcome. Some organizations have a strong bench to draw from. Others are constrained and have limited resources. In either case, you can approach this issue by asking yourself, what additional focused resources do we need to, 
to achieve our business imperative by the required date. Who in our organization has the skills and the bandwidth to fill this role? With, the, with this additional commitment of resources, compromise other important organizational priorities. Can you offload these roles temporarily or backfill for their temporary absence? In our experience, if you don't put effective project management resources in place up front, you are visibly, um, who are visibly tasked with making this performance improvement initiative their top priority, we repeatedly see the following negative consequences downstream. A project management vacuum will slow down your initiative or reduce the benefits you can achieve within the required timeline. Important visible milestones will be missed, which undermines the credibility of the project and its leadership sponsors. Lack of coordination causes confusion and results in mixed messages. And finally, resource shortages and roadblocks will be missed or identified so late that the early energies of your most engaged managers may be squandered. Why? Because what they needed most was the timely removal of obstacles to their forward progress. Recently, for instance, we worked with a client hospital where project management resources were identified but didn't have the bandwidth or skills to embrace the role proactively. We corrected the problem by naming an alternate project manager, which allowed us to discover that our lack of progress to date was actually the result of one or more key executives who were not on board. They felt they enjoyed a kind of protected status to ignore their target, and this was undermining other executives' willingness to engage and meet their targets. Next, I'll pass the next pitfall on to Bob. Thank you, Francis. The next uh, common pitfall is the failure to address team weaknesses up front. A failure to acknowledge the weaknesses and address them up front can undermine your initiative and decrease your chances for success. This is especially true when those weaknesses are present in key areas or departments. While there may be a desire to give everyone an opportunity to be successful, the skill set needed to lead change is different than the capabilities required during more normal times. The ability to think outside the box, inspire creativity, hold people accountable, lean thinking, strong manage time management skills, all can contribute to more successful outcomes. Also, experience in other hospitals and health systems can increase understandings of different ways of doing things. In some cases, you may be doing a manager a favor by sparing them the stress that can come with a major change initiative. I was once leading a team of facilitators to improve the workflows of a hospital's key departments. The leader of one department was new in her job and generally recognized not to have a strong background going into her new position. But the CEO chose to give her a chance despite the concerns. In the middle of the project, I actually discovered her in an aisle at a local grocery store in tears, clearly crumbling under the pressure of leading change. Now, she stepped down shortly after that, but the work of her improvement team was derailed. Now, on the other hand, it's not unusual in a major improvement initiative for some people you believe that will do well to struggle, and for some people you don't expect a lot out of to step up and shine. Assembling a strong team to set your organization up for success requires very careful judgments. Francis, uh, back to you for another common pitfall. Got it, Bob. The next one I wanted to talk about, I spoke about it a, a moment ago, was the importance of communication. And yet over and over again, we see that leadership tends to underestimate the resource requirements and to discount the value of thoughtful communications, planning, and execution. Let me give you some examples. It's not uncommon for leaders to act as if they can limit their efforts to a big splash of communication planning and launch messaging and then treat communication as an optional activity thereafter. But this is a mistake. The messaging needs of a broad and diverse set of stakeholders doesn't stop after getting their marching orders. They will keep evolving over the project life cycle as the organizational context and project status evolves. The second example we see is leadership hoping to avoid communicating with certain stakeholders that have proven problematic in the past, 
but clearly have a legitimate stake in the change effort. Ignoring affected stakeholders, such as physicians, or treating some like a third rail will only come back to bite you later. Third, it's surprisingly time-consuming, but still critical to ensure that your messaging is responsive to each audience's needs, well-matched to the messenger's style and capabilities, plus fits the delivery method selected. Don't underestimate the resources or the breadth of the skill sets required. In closing, I'd like to speculate that it may be hard for leaders to acknowledge that fear may be causing them to avoid proactive, thoughtful communications. Fear, which is fueled by the false assumption that keeping controversial issues hidden will protect them and their organization from negative PR or morale consequences. In fact, if properly resourced, planning for communication transparency allows you to frame the vision and to better shape the ensuing dialogue. Reframe your mental model by reminding yourself that the downstream consequences of vague, non-transparent, or uncoordinated messaging could doom an otherwise productive and hard-fought performance improvement effort. Dan, why don't you take you through, take us through to the fourth and final pitfall? Sadly, thanks, Francis. You know, not holding management accountable for results at all levels of the organization honestly undermines the credibility and the sense of urgency you've asked everyone to rally around. By letting some leaders slide, the burden becomes greater for others if the overall targets are to be met. But this can diminish overall cooperation, willingness to stretch and make change, as well as slow down or halt the needed progress to financial sustainability. Everybody needs to have some skin in the game and a sense that failure will not be a career enhancer. Um, I think it's also important to have a reporting system in place that tracks the progress of the initiative, ensures the initiative is on track, and that everyone is putting forth a good faith effort to achieving their assigned targets. Those managers who are struggling to find solutions should be offered support, uh, sometimes with outside resources if necessary. But a message of that failure is not an option needs to be sent and reinforced. The needs of the organization and the communities it supports are far greater than any one individual. Um, so I think, uh, you know, that concludes our part of the presentation. Uh, now we'd like to answer any questions that you might have. I'm actually going to pass the mic over to our colleague, Amy, to facilitate the Q&A conversation. Amy? All right. Thank you, Dan. So we do have a handful of questions that came in, and so we can run through those and um, get those answered for our audience. So the first one, maybe I'll hand it to you, Dan, is how can we ensure proposed solutions will be appropriate and effective and not smoke and mirrors? Yeah, great question. Um, as I mentioned, every idea really should have a, should be formally documented and include important details of the logic that anybody can understand. So it should capture information, excuse me, information related to who's responsible for the idea, who's involved in the process, uh, es implemented, es excuse me, estimated implementation date, the savings calculation methodology, and any associated backup, uh, any instructions on how you can track progress after it's, once it's been implemented, that is. So once those ideas are documented, uh, they should be passed by your finance team in the, to, for their validation and their endorsement before being presented to the leadership for, for their review and final approval. And by following these steps in the sequence, it provides enough redundancy to expose any weaknesses associated with any given idea. And I think it also welcomes different perspectives that will help flesh out the ideas a little further and ensure that they do, in fact, hold water. All right, nice. Um, so another one that came in, uh, Bob, maybe you can take this one, is what are some of the approaches to get physicians on board with a change initiative? Well, that's uh, very clearly an important thing to uh, put effort into. It's always important, but a, a difficult challenge. But we shouldn't shy away from our doctors to avoid conflict or pushback. I think one of the keys is to very early on involve multiple physicians from different specialties. You need to ensure that they're represented in the oversight group. And if you can, enlist one or two champions among your medical staff 
And what's interesting, if you can convince your biggest skeptics, he or she may become your biggest supporters. Very much worth the effort. And be prepared to answer the question, what is it up for them? Provide wins for them, not just for the hospital. And you also should be able to provide clear explanations of the benefits to the patients and to the community. Back to you, Amy. All right, good answer. Um, not to put you on the spot twice, Bob, but I think this next one um, would be a good one for you as well. How can leadership demonstrate the seriousness of the business imperative and the need to consider all potential solutions? Well, another good question. Well, I'm enjoying these. Um, you know, what I've seen be very successful uh, is for leadership to look at themselves first. It's very common for frontline staff to view management as top heavy, whether that is true or not. Doing a management reorg as a first step is very symbolic. It, it sends a message that the situation is serious and that actual caregivers are the priority for the organization. But another benefit is the opportunity to move weak or low performers out, as we discussed earlier, to strengthen your remaining team. And there's a third benefit, and that is there can be some real dollars available in a reorg. Uh, looking at span of control often has a significant financial benefit. Back to you, Amy, if there's other questions or time allows. Yes, so a couple more questions, and Francis, I'll throw one at you. Um, if we focus on labor, are we sending the wrong message, especially given what our staff has been through for the last one and a half years? Well, obviously, we couldn't agree more that this is a very relevant concern considering um, the events of the pandemic. Uh, but it doesn't change our collective obligation to keep our organization on sound financial footing. So let me just speak to some of the options um, that leadership has and some of the trade-offs which are involved. Um, once we agree the status quo is unsustainable, the business imperative really needs to drive the process of determining the scope and focus of a performance improvement initiative. A thorough assessment should be used to reveal where you have the best opportunities that being said, it is almost always better to focus on all three areas, supply chain, revenue cycle, and labor. However, um, setting your final targets by area should be informed by insights gained from your recent efforts at performance improvement. For instance, did you already recently complete a performance improvement initiative in supply chain or revenue cycle? Was it successful and are there remaining uh, significant opportunities? Admittedly, supply chain is an easier place to start from a morale perspective because changes don't result in the loss of income or jobs for any of your employees. However, ideally, everyone should still have some skin in the game when it comes to achieving the organization's overall business imperative. Typically, leadership may also have the option to sequence the work across different aspects of operational performance, but even that prerogative may be limited if the performance gap is particularly large or the deadlines to achieve them are particularly short. If that is the case, leadership may be forced to launch all areas of work simultaneously. Back to you, Amy. All right, thank you. We have one more question that came in and then we'll wrap things up. Uh, many organizations initiate cost-saving measures. However, most struggle with sustainability of the gains. Any insights on how to sustain the gains? And I'll open that I'd up to anyone. To All right, thank you. Sorry, Amy. I'd be happy to take that one. Uh, I think the key is to keep the spotlight on the initiative long after people think it's over. It's very common that steering committees, when the consultants go away or whoever is leading the charge, uh, moves on and, and, and they shut down the steering committee and that monitoring doesn't continue to happen. And then it takes on more of the characteristic of the flavor of the month. Now we're working on patient satisfaction, or now we're working on some quality initiatives. That review has to continue. The steering committee, maybe they don't meet as frequently, but they need to continue to look and make sure that the gains are being held. The finance people need to continue 
to monitor that the results are translated in the bottom line. And each executive, when they meet with their direct reports, needs to continue to review what's going on with your improvement plans. Now that you've implemented, are you running into any problems? Uh, what can I do to support you? But I think the main message here is don't take the focus off prematurely. Back to you, Amy. All right, thank you. And that is the questions that came through. So uh, I will pass it back to Dan to give some of his final comments. Uh, thanks so much, Amy. Uh, well, honestly, I, I think on behalf of Bob Francis, myself, and the entire Performance Excellence team, we really do appreciate your time, your value time today. Um, you know, as we conclude, we, we offer our, our contact information here should you have any follow-up questions. But above all, we really wish you all best wishes as you continue the incredible, important work of supporting our vital healthcare teams. And certainly, we wish you to stay in good health, take care of yourselves, and take care of each other. Um, Amy, I think that we've got some housekeeping items to give to these folks for uh, downloading their CPE certificate and some surveys. So uh, as we end, I'll just hand it back over to you to close us out. All right, thank you. And thank you, Dan, Bob, and Francis for a great presentation today. And thank you to our audience for your participation and for submitting those questions. And as a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in your console. If you participated as an individual and met all requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. And we'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download. And a copy will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. And here is a list of some resources and links that may be beneficial to your organization. Um, our healthcare content hub is a good place to explore our insights and solutions for accounting, tax, finance, and business operations challenges. And all of these links can be found in your webcast console to the right of the slide view. And your console also has a link to our COVID-19 resources, so definitely check that out as well. There are ways we can help you navigate, rebuild, and thrive in this environment. And finally, here's a link to an online survey for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. And thank you for joining our webcast. We hope you'll join us again next time.